So thank you all for coming. This is, of course, the final lecture in the first semester Cornell Contemporary China Initiative Lecture Series. And as I just mentioned, uh, in celebration of the completion of the first semester, there will be a reception after tonight's talk. So you're welcome to join us next door in the first floor of the new physical science building. Uh, tonight, uh, we're very fortunate to have uh, Professor Victor Nee with us, who has been teaching here at Cornell for most of his career, uh, and has been spending uh, also most of that time, I would say, doing research on uh, tonight's topic, capitalism in China. Uh, Professor Nee earned his PhD from Harvard uh, in sociology in 1977, came here to Cornell uh, briefly, uh, was lured away to uh, the beautiful climate of uh, California, taught at uh, UC Santa Barbara, uh, then was lured back again uh, and has been with us ever since, uh, much to our good fortune, uh, and has spent, as I said, that time uh, doing research and uh, many, many publications on a number of things in the field of sociology, but particularly on the rise of capitalism in China over the past uh, three decades or so. Um, and so uh, I could spend a very long time listing his many, many articles and uh, books, but I want to focus on his most recent book, Capitalism from Below, Markets and Institutional Change in China, which was published in 2012. Uh, it is uh, the uh, research topic that he will also be talking to us about this evening. Uh, and it is also the same subject that uh, we'll be debuting as a new undergraduate course here, uh, we think maybe a year from now uh, at Cornell, once he's back uh, from uh, uh, sabbatic leave. Uh, and so that should be very good news for everyone because it's very interesting, uh, fascinating research he's been doing. The book earned uh, enormous uh, amounts of accolades, won several awards, uh, prestigious awards, including the James S. Coleman Best Book Award uh, from the American Sociological Association in 2014, and in 2013, the George R. Terry Book Award uh, from the Academy of Management, uh, and uh, it's been, uh, as I said, much appreciated for uh, the depth of its research and for uh, the, uh, of course, the topic, uh, 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 of topicality of the topic, the, uh, <laughs> of how uh, fascinating the topic is at this moment, uh, right? To see the sort of the, the depth of the work he's done over so many years, coming now to publication at a time when everyone's very interested in the topic of capitalism in China. So uh, I will uh, leave it at at that, and let us uh, welcome Professor Ni, and let's hear what he has to say. About that. I'm delighted to be here to. Uh, present a discussion of the rise of a new economic order in a country that really had never had had um, the scale of modern dynamic capitalism that emerged uh, after the start of economic reform in 1978. So the puzzle is where did it come from? Uh, and that's what I want to address in today's lecture. Uh, and this is part of a ongoing study that has been a decade long uh, engagement with studying the emergence of this new economic order. Um, and we are still uh, involved in the study. This year we will be doing another round of uh, surveys of following the same CEOs, the same company, 700 of them, that we have been following and interviewing for the last decade. Uh, and we will be uh, meeting with them later this year, the research team uh, based in Shanghai. And we will be following up on the last time since we had met with them, which was three years ago. And we want to know how these people have experienced this very difficult last three years, uh, as well as to conduct our labs in the field experiments, our surveys, and just keeping up with the people who are leading 
the rise of capitalism in China. And I'm working with a group, uh, international research team uh, here at Cornell, which I lead, and also uh, a group of economists at Lund University in Sweden. So here's the story that begins, uh, that you're familiar with. Um, the Chinese political elite saw they were in an impasse. They just had had a decade of turmoil, the great proletarian cultural revolution. Uh, and they, it was finally concluded, uh, it was a mess. Uh, the economy was stagnant. Um, and they sent out delegations to Japan, to the United States, and here's Deng Xiaoping wearing his cowboy hat in Texas. And they see the world has changed dramatically since 1949 um, when the Chinese Communist Power uh, Chinese Communist Party came to power. And that China, which had an economy about the size of Japan, um, after they visited <laughs> Japan, had fallen so far behind. The rest of the world had experienced tremendous technological progress, economic progress, including Asia. Uh, and, the, and so they saw that they had to do something. They, this was a defining moment, which they compared to the uh, late, last era of the Qing dynasty and the, peri the, the situation that China found itself in, in the Opium War in their defeat to the uh, 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 British Navy. So they felt they had to do something uh, to revitalize a stagnant state-owned economy, which was technologically backward uh, in a very large agrarian economy, which was on a per capita basis, one of the poorest in the world that spent on per capita education about what Bangladesh was spending. So this was a dire situation uh, which they sought to address. And the leader of the reform was Deng Xiaoping, uh, who was the pragmatist uh, that wanted to see something done. He didn't care whether it was a uh, black cat or a white cat. He just wanted to make sure that uh, the economy could recover from this devastating uh, decade of political turmoil, which led to the closure of the entire education system uh, from the uh, elementary schools to, 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 the, to, to, to the, especially the elite universities. Uh, and so the reform was to revitalize. It was a conservative, conservative reform, not to transform anything, but to just get things moving again. They certainly did not expect and want to see capitalism uh, come out of the reform because really it was still a country governed by the same political party, the Chinese Communist Party, which was committed to uh, socialism. Um, despite the arguments between the different factions, this was a, co a long-term commitment which they were not about to give up. And it, including Deng Xiaoping, the pragmatist. So what happened? By 2009, an economy that was almost entirely state-owned, without a market part, uh, suddenly was producing only 20%, that is the industrial economy, uh, of the industrial output uh, generated. And this was then uh, a very rapid decline of the state-owned economy. And instead, out from nowhere, really, you have a private enterprise economy of industrialists who are producing 40% or more of the gross national product. And that the domestic industries uh, owned by private uh, entrepreneurs uh, were producing 40% of the industrial profits and employing 47% of the non-farm labor force. So this is rapid change uh, within a relatively short time because the economic reforms didn't really begin until 1978. So the question is, what is capitalism? Uh, uh, and because this is quite a uh, distinctive economic system. Uh, and we have here uh, guess who? Uh, Adam Smith, the Karl Marx, 
Joseph Schumpeter, John Maynard Keene, the theorist of modern Western capitalism, because it began as an economic order in the West. Uh, and at the time of the takeover of, the, of China by the Communist Party, only 1% of the domestic bus business firms owned by Chinese were uh, corporations, limited liability companies. The main part of the Chinese economy that were corporate were the treaty ports, and this involved the large, big businesses of Western firms located in the treaty ports. So we have to see and define what happened. Well, what was it that uh, we can call the rise of capitalism in China? So modern capitalism is distinctive. It's a dynamic system of economy. Uh, Schumpeter called it a system that is based on creative destruction. And what did he mean by creative destruction? He meant that this is a system where firms to survive and compete and profit need to innovate. And they need to innovate uh, as a means of standard operation. And that the innovation process uh, generates new technologies, new products, which shakes up the old industries. And, uh, and leads them to their de decline and demise. So we think of Detroit in the 1980s, the Rust Bowl. Well, that's a distinctive aspect of capitalism. It's dynamic. It is always renewing itself through innovation. And entrepreneurs who lead the innovation and the creativity often come from the periphery. Uh, they are not part of the established order. Think of Steve Jobs. He was an orphan who was adopted in a working class family in Silicon Valley and one of the great entrepreneurs of American history. Uh, so it's not from places like Cornell or Harvard that the greatest entrepreneurs will come from, uh, but maybe the managers, maybe the, certainly the elite. And with Capitalism, there's a tremendous tendency for intense outburst of entrepreneurial action. That it doesn't come by drips and drabs, but it's a very intense outburst. Uh, and think of the United States at the time that Cornell University was founded after the Civil War. That was a period of great industrial growth in the United States, especially here in upstate New York. Or think of the information revolution and the rise of Silicon Valley. Uh, this was a period of tremendous explosion of creativity and innovation. And so Schumpeter, Schumpeter who is the main theorist that I'm drawing on, said, well, OK, without this, the entrepreneurs and dynamic capitalism of creative destruction, you will have stagnation, a circular flow, uh, lots of competition but no progress. And it's through creative destruction, innovation, uh, creativity, not just in new products, but new modes of production, new sources of raw material, new organization of industry, that you have uh, the dynamism of capitalism. And so this is an economic order that uh, emerged in the West in the Industrial Revolution and transformed the West, uh, North America, Western Europe, but it arrived in China more in the way of gunboat diplomacy uh, and, it did, and treaty ports. And China ha was not really part of this type of domestic uh, economic revolution. So the question is really, where did the economic institutions of capitalism come from? that gave rise to a dynamic form of capitalism in China that is now the, main, the driver of the Chinese economy uh, uh, and shaking up uh, constantly the, the stronghold of the state-owned economy. So generally speaking, people who think of China, they think of a one-party system and they think of change coming from the top down, uh, from, uh, from the uh, politburo of the Chinese Communist Party. 
And so this is the consensus view that uh, it was Deng Xiaoping uh, that put in place uh, modern dynamic capitalism. But, and this is certainly the argument in Ezra Vogel's biography of Deng Xiaoping, uh, it is a generally well accepted view, and there are good reasons to think <coughs> this, because Deng Xiaoping, after all, was the leader who started the economic reform. Uh, and so the question really is, can capitalism come from top down? Uh, because in the West, it was bottom up. Uh, uh, whether it was in Great Britain or France or no uh, North America, it was it, capitalism and entrepreneurship has been a bottom up process. Uh, and so the puzzle is, and certainly Deng Xiaoping didn't want capitalism. He said that. Uh, the Chinese Communist League said that. They didn't want it. They put in place rules uh, that would uh, limit the extent of growth of the private enterprise economy. So to address this puzzle, I've been involved in a study in the Yangtze Delta region. Uh, these are three provinces here, and you can see this is the coastal areas, the center of private enterprise economy, and it gets thin as you go into the hinterlands. Uh, and this area is quite remarkable because that's the center of a domestic form of uh, capitalism uh, in this modern sense of based on innovation as the driver of growth. You have in the Pearl River Delta uh, a center of private enterprise, but this is where iPhones are produced. This is where uh, foreign companies have invested uh, for uh, uh, production of uh, subcontracting production, but it is not so much domestic as this area. Now, the Yangtze Delta area is really quite a special area, actually, and I've been involved uh, with research with uh, a group of economists at Moon University, where we're going back in time uh, uh, to the Neolithic and collecting data, which we did not collect, but which was collected by the new archeology span that has been so active in China. Going back to the 7,000 BC to 2,000 BC, the, uh, the Neolithic. Uh, uh, this is the period where you have the beginning of mobile groups of hunter-gatherers looking for more permanent settlement or semi-permanent settlement and developing uh, more complex uh, uh, villages uh, and more complex housing. And you have the emergence of craft production, pottery, and domestication of uh, pigs and chicken. Uh, and you have uh, evidence of civilization emerging. And it ha it's no accident that the Yangtze Delta region was a center of Neolithic uh, settlement, and it was uh, way ahead of other parts of China. Uh, it was certainly uh, the place where uh, settled villages and pottery and, and rice wet rice agriculture first began. Um, then we, what w they did was to collect data every 500 years uh, from about 7,000 BC to 2,000 BC, uh, measuring indication of settlement and s cooperation and, and activity that reflected uh, a level of uh, domestication and early signs of civilization. And then we went to the Tang Dynasty and the Sung Dynasty and Ming Dynasties to study water projects, which involves a large-scale collaboration. Uh, and then the Republican period to study the levels of market development and commercialization. Uh, using a 1935 survey of households that measured the extent to which Chinese households were involved in buying products in the marketplace. And what you see here is that through, there's a very high level of correlation uh, going back to the early Neolithic and extending to the late Neolithic uh, of, with the development of private firms 
in yeah, the Yangtze Delta region. So this is a uh, account of levels of pro-social behavior, levels of cooperation in the area, and it's highly correlated with the development of modern capitalism in the Yangtze Delta area. And so this suggests that it wasn't by accident that the Yangtze Delta region was so um, quick to uh, develop the modern forms of capitalism um, in its response to economic reform. And here you see a lot more detail regressions that were done by Opper and Anderson to show that the, the high level correlation um, of past measures of regional cooperation and development with the density of private manufacturing firms in the Yangtze Delta region. Uh, and so this establishes why this region, which was the most developed region uh, in China before the modern period, which had the highest standard of living in China, the, uh, in fact, in the world, uh, the, the most developed technology in science uh, until the modern period, until the Industrial Revolution in England, uh, why the Yangtze Delta would respond so quickly and so effectively to g give rise to a modern form of capitalism. So what you have here is a deep reservoir of novel ways to recombine uh, traditional norms and traditional uh, cultural beliefs with new norms of a uh, capitalist economy. Uh, and what I mean by this is that you see here a worker. I've gone to many, many factories, hundreds of factories, and you see uh, this evidence of intense concentration on production. So China didn't emerge simply as a low-cost manufacturer, but it was low-cost manufacturing uh, that recombined with the artisan tr the tradition of artisanship, which was so well developed in the Yangtze Delta region. Think of Hangzhou uh, as a center of silk craft uh, and uh, pottery. And this was, again, going a tradition that goes far back in the history of this region. Uh, and so this was the great advantage, that they had low-cost manufacturing, traditional artisanship that was recombined with it, and educated, healthy, young workers who were produced from the populist rural policy of the Mao Zedong era. Uh, and so that was, off, uh, again, part of the great advantage. Now, the distinctive aspect of the rise of capitalism was that when it first emerged, it was illegitimate. It was illegal, actually, uh, from the point of view of the government. And so the question is, how does a system that requires so much in the way of well-developed economic institutions uh, emerge if it's emerging against the law uh, as an illegitimate form of production? Because the Chinese government was very clear. They said, if you, you can have private enterprises, but it should be petty household production should never employ more than seven workers. Beyond that, it's exploitation uh, and capitalism. So they checked it there to seven workers. So the question is, how did this come about? That you, I, in, 19, in 2005, we were visiting factories with 150 workers, 200 workers, uh, and involved in this modern form of production. Well, much of it was taking place through networks, social networks, which sociologists like myself study. Uh, and th we asked the entrepreneurs, 700 of them, well, what do you do with your five closest business relationships? What goes on in that, those relationships? The people you uh, have more to do with, not your relatives, but other businessmen. And so we see that in these ties, there are many things that are going on. Um, there, uh, 
involved with jointly purchasing material inputs, cooperating on joint technology development. They're involved in cooperating, cooperation in sales and marketing. And they're introducing each other to business uh, relationships and customers. So we see a great deal of cooperation taking place within networks. Now this is a region that we know going back to the Neolithic period had already developed a high level of pro-social cooperative behavior as part of the culture of this region. So what we see in the model of what led to and or the emergence of the key economic institutions of capitalism is that you have, it's based on personalized exchange, uh, repeated exchange between economic actors. And it takes place within multiplex complex networks uh, that are involved and linked this region through social relationships. And that community sanctions, norms, matter, that people care about their reputation, they care about credible commitments to their promises, that a verbal agreement is a real agreement because it affects your reputation. Uh, that's a critical social capital. And so this is not surprising because this is a region that had already developed very advanced levels of ultra pro-social behavior which we documented in that it had going back to the Neolithic and uh, involving this Tang, Sung and Ming dynasty where this is a region that had developed advanced water work which requires cooperation in the region. The Grand Canal uh, was developed here going from uh, Hangzhou to, to Beijing. So this is what we see that it's so much of the rise of capitalism, as was true in the United States and Great Britain and France, takes place within networks regulated by norms of honesty, of restraint, of cooperation among business people. So clearly social norms matter. Uh, that is what others expect of us. Others expect of us to be honest about our uh, products, uh, to not cheat, this matters. And we know this in our own lives. Think of it that if uh, tax discipline, we just filed our income tax, uh, everybody has to do this. But once th that discipline begins to decline uh, and evasion becomes more common, it's harder to maintain tax discipline. Uh, so we're influenced by the conduct of others. And closer to home, sometimes we think we're invited to dinner parties. And for faculty, we generally want to dress up. But it has been recently acceptable to come to dinner parties in the sports coat and jeans. Well, you feel out of it if you're the only person. But if everybody else is coming to the dinner party with jeans and sports coat, then you feel better about it. So the idea that social influence and uh, the expectation of others is important, certainly was a key to the emergence of capitalism in China because so much of that emergence was taking place out in informal institutions below the radar of the government uh, and this was how they did it because as many entrepreneurs told me in the beginning it was like the Wild West, the people were cheating, they were not, uh, there was opportunism and malfeasance. So they had to organize a economy that there were credible commitments that people could tr count on. Trust and reputation matters. So what I'd like to do is, again, what we social scientists like to do. We like to model the world uh, conceptually act in abstract form. And this is what we call a Schelling diagram. Thomas Schelling won the Nobel Prize uh, on the uh, demonstrating through his models that our behavior is influenced by others and how others behave, that we are social uh, uh, animals. And so here in the y-axis, you have um, individual utility. The higher you go, the greater the utility you get from a 
set of con uh, action. Here on this number is a number of people who are taking that action. As the number grows, um, the individual utility also increases because the more that joins your uh, group, the easier it gets and less risky it is. So the more entrepreneurs, startup firms, manufacturing uh, products with more than seven workers, it gets easier to do, especially if everybody in the city is doing the same thing, uh, either working for an entrepreneur or uh, working in, as an op entrepreneur. So this would be a view, this is the cost of, uh, this, of um, this is the cost of uh, not complying, the enforcement me mechanisms of the state. And this is the reward from decoupling or deviance. Um, and so it was deviant to start a private firm in the beginning. These were the pioneers. And this would be a model where the formal rules the legal rules and the law uh, would be dominant. Uh, and this would be before the economic reform, especially under uh, Mao, especially during the great proletarian cultural revolution. It never was paid off to, 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 to um, oppose the legal rules and start private firms. And here you have uh, the opposite situation where you have a failed state. It always pays to uh, be deviant and decouple. And it never costs that much uh, in the way of the enforcement of the rules by government. And what I want to focus on here is the emergence of capitalism. Uh, that as the numbers of entrepreneurs increase, the cost of doing so, the risk declines. And so you have a equilibrium point, a tipping point, where in the beginning you have uh, pioneers who take risk. Uh, they risk expropriation by government. They risk uh, sanctions by the community. But as their numbers grow uh, over time, uh, there's a tipping point where so many people are involved that uh, it becomes less risky uh, and less costly in terms of uh, government enforcement. And the government then is less able to enforce because there's so many people uh, who are uh, involved in the private enterprise economy. Uh, that happens a little slower there. So with the emergence of economic institutions, what we see is a bottom-up process of construction of the economic institutions that enable and motivate and guide rapid development of this private enterprise economy. Uh, it is a bottom-up emergence rather than uh, responding to top-down guidance. And here are the key economic institutions that you came from below. You need to have financial markets. And the formal financial markets, the state-owned banks, would not lend money to illegitimate private firms. Uh, they lent money to the state-owned enterprises that were favored by the government and protected by the government. You had the emergence of what we call industrial clusters, intense concentration of an industry in a village or a town. And you see this all over the Yangtze Delta, the largest uh, center of button collection takes place in the village. Uh, the largest uh, uh, production of household knives take place in the township area. So you have this emerging. And then you see uh, autonomous private suppliers and, net, uh, and, and distribution networks. But what I want to focus on, because this you could see in traditional China as well, uh, informal financial markets, uh, concentration in certain areas of industry, silk industry, uh, pottery industry, and you had private suppliers and distribution. But what is really new is the development of research and development cap capacity, which is the essence of modern capitalism to innovate. Uh, and modern labor markets, which would provide, uh, again, remember Marx's focus on labor markets, labor and capital. Uh, 
and uh, so labor market. So we'll look at these two institutions. And we see, again, this process of private enterprise uh, developing uh, rapidly following successive tipping points, driven like a social movement. There are areas where the entire county town shifts over to private debt production. The party secretary's brother is a factory uh, owner. And so you see this social movement where generally people you talk with are involved in one way or the other, working, providing supplies, subcontractors, the entrepreneurs, it becomes uh, the thing to do. And, and people see that this is a way of wealth creation. So very rapid uh, wealth creation takes place in this region. Uh, it probably has one of the highest concentrations of millionaires in the world now. Uh, it provides employment, uh, non-farm employment. So this is an area where migrant laborers come to work from uh, the hinterlands of China. And for government, it provides taxable revenue. And this is key. Uh, governments um, uh, need revenue to build their new office buildings, to pay their salaries. And so this becomes a important reason why the Chinese government at the central level and most importantly at the regional level uh, began to change the rules of the game to legitimate what was already taking place on the ground that was producing wealth, a lot of it, quickly, employment uh, to keep the masses not discontent. They have to have jobs. Uh, and the taxable revenue that uh, went into government coffers that was so important. And so you can see a process where first the bottom-up emergence and then government legitimizes ex post uh, after the changes had already taken place in the economy. Now, one aspect of rapid change like this is that there is a cost to be especially an early entrepreneur uh, decoupling from the state-owned system, which has all the legitimacy. And indeed, um, anybody who's familiar with communist uh, era, that there has been always a concern about profiteers, uh, tales of ca uh, capitalism, suspicious elements in villages and towns that were moving towards private enterprise. Uh, and so the audience, um, ordinary people as well as government officials, uh, generally in the early period especially, but even today, have cultural beliefs that uh, stigmatize the entrepreneurs and they have a harder time um, um, gaining social approval and respect, uh, even though they have created great wealth on their own. They try to hide it if they can. Uh, and they never know when there will be another turn to the left, another big mobilization, social movement. And so this is an aspect of great concern to the entrepreneurs. And certainly this came up in our many interviews with them, that they, there is a, a certain amount of uncertainty that they confront, uh, where they have risks that they face due to the lack of cultural and social legitimacy. Well, what happened, and this was not expected by government nor by the entrepreneurs, was that so many of the state-owned firms were losing money, going bankrupt, uh, that the government decided something had to be done. There's too many loss-making state-owned firms that are a liability rather than a source of revenue. So they came up with the idea. Uh, well. In the West, there are public corporations that are listed on stock markets. They like the idea of public corporations. Uh, and so we will think of a way to uh, allow the state-owned firms to become corporations in the modern sense and to be listed on the new stock exchanges in Shenzhen and Shanghai. And so we will uh, let them become limited liability 
companies. And the first limited liability company was in the Netherlands, uh, the Dutch East India, India Company, the first modern corporation. And the key to limited liability company is that your investment your, is your liability, and that if the business fails, you are, your personal property is not liable to bankruptcy suits. Before 1949, only 1% 1 of the Chinese domestic firms were limited liability companies, even though there was a company law that was passed in the latter decade of the Qing Dynasty. So, in 1994, the Chinese central government passed the company law. Uh, and this basically mimicked the company law of the United States and Australia, you know, Western corporations, and the idea of board of directors, CEOs, uh, annual meetings, um, uh, the whole s set of rules of uh, the modern Western corporation, with one exception. <laughs> the company law gave constitutional right to the Chinese Communist Party to organize in the factory and establish a communist branch. So that was the exception. It was a constitutional right um, to do so. But the idea was to form a modern enterprise system, one which uh, could enable these old rickety state-owned firms that were losing so much money uh, to re reform and to become modern public corporations, modern enterprise. So this sounded very good, and the private entrepreneurs saw this as a great opportunity. They wanted to be part of this. It gave legitimacy, it gave them legal rights, it gave them uh, what they lacked as just simply uh, private enterprise. They could be modern corporations, part of this modern enterprise system. So there was a rush on the part of these private entrepreneurs to sign up to be uh, limited liability corporations and have their board of trusted directors, their CEOs, their uh, meetings, and follow the uh, aspect of the rules. And so people we interviewed said, well, you know, we became limited liability firm because it just sounds better to be a limited uh, liability firm or that it's what everybody else did. And so this became a way in which almost 70% of the private manufacturing firms in our sample of 700 are now listed as LLC, limited liability corporations or companies. And so this is the beginning the legal beginning of modern domestic capitalism, uh, which was not intended, uh, but, but it, nonetheless it happened. Uh, and now you have uh, corporations. So I want to focus on these two key economic institutions, the labor market, um, labor capital, remember that? There's a book recently published by uh, Piketty, a French economist, called Capital. And the basic idea is that capital over a long period of time will get a higher return than labor, which was not what Marx had hoped for, uh, and which was why Marx wanted a revolution. Um, but so where did labor markets come from? Because they developed a national labor market uh, before the first labor law was drafted. Uh, the labor law should have put in place a modern labor market, but in fact, it had already been in place. It had merged bottom up. Uh, and so how it happened was that initially these factory owners recruited uh, workers, often from the same village, often involving people they knew, uh, sometimes relatives, sometimes friends. But it quickly emerged to be er ergodic, which means that it began to shift from personal referrals to impersonal labor market that sucked in labor from faraway provinces like Sichuan or the nearby province of Anhui. Um, and that this was a emergence from a economy that simply did not have a labor market because work was assigned by the state under the central planning system put in place by Mao that you then had a 
genuine interprovincial labor market that emerged that brought labor and human capital to, uh, to work in the private manufacturing firms, and it evolved bottom up. Uh, so this is a key aspect of this important economic institution. And furthermore, that it quickly evolved into a diversified labor market uh, where you can see this guy's a technical worker. Uh, and so it led to a diversified labor market with different more forms of recruitment uh, for unskilled workers that were coming in from Anhui province or Sichuan they relied on impersonal markets because obviously it doesn't really matter who does the uh, assembly because that's not so critical to the profitability and success of the firm or to innovation. Here's a guy probably has, uh, is involved in the more important part of the firm. But the part that is involved in technical personnel, in engineers, in management relies on personal referral because here they want to know something about the background of the person. Is this person trustworthy? Is this person, how good is this person? And that type of information flows through networks, the fine-grained, detailed information that enable you to assess the trustworthiness, the capability of someone. And so the more important the employee to the firm, the more it relies on the network. And the case of uh, uh, low-skill migrant labor that relies on, on, on the impersonal labor market. And clearly, when you should, once you have labor markets, you're interested in how other workers are dealing, doing in a way of compensation. Marx was concerned that labor markets enabled capitalists to exploit workers uh, because suddenly the worker was in the position to sell their most important uh, uh, resource, their labor power, to the capitalists. And so here we see in the cities that we study, five of them, we studied seven cities, uh, Shanghai, Nanjing, Nantung, Hangzhou, and Wan, uh, Wenzhou, and there's also Changzhou and, and, uh, and uh, let's see, and Ningbo, but they're not here that actually if you are a worker in a state-owned firm, you're doing better than, you're, than a worker in a private firm. And so this is a very important uh, lesson that the state-owned firms in some ways were loss-making because they were more generous to the workers. Uh, and there was a Communist Party watching out for the workers in the state-owned firms. In the private firms, though they're not that far apart, uh, the capitalist is interested in profits and is willing to uh, get workers uh, for what they are willing to work for. So it's a market exchange. Uh, and so you do see uh, a difference. And so young people tend to want to work in state-owned firms. Uh, and uh, people who wouldn't get a job in state-owned firms because they're not urban people in Shanghai or Hangzhou coming from the countryside work in the private enterprise. Whether it's exploitation or just the action of labor markets uh, is a question which uh, we thought about. Uh, and certainly what we see in this region is the region grows very quickly. They ran into labor shortage. And the sh greater the shortage of labor, including unskilled labor, the higher the wage will be as firms compete for labor, especially skilled labor. And so this region has experienced double-digit wage growth in the last 15 years, uh, partly driven by minimum wage law and partly driven by shortage of workers. OK, the second key and institution is the market for innovation. Um, and this is a photograph I took of a in a f uh, firm, um, uh, Brett went to this firm too, uh, of Wu Li Tang, uh, Wu Li Ping. This is a, the control board for an automatic packaging machine, uh, which, uh, and this entrepreneur has about 80 patents. Uh, and so you can see that he, he ha it has a, and he has a large research and development department. 
And now, what kind of innovations are involved here? Uh, and here's one of the very common type of innovation. They're not path-breaking, transformative innovations, really. But one of the manufacturers of kitchen appliances and, and household appliances is Hire. They sell washing machines and refrigerators in the United States. Notice that they were getting lots of warranty claims from villages uh, for their washing machines. So they sent out somebody to check up to see what was going on. And they discovered the reason why so many washing machines were breaking was that the villagers were washing their vegetables <laughs> and their clothes in the washing machine. So higher thought about it, and they did develop a washing machine that could do both. It could wash vegetables in one mode and uh, wash clothes in another mode. And so this type of innovation is driven by consumers. And that is the type of innovation that is most common. And what is striking about this random sample of private manufacturers is that 42% of them say they set aside resources for research and development. And it's very high, 42%. And that 65% say they are involved in some type of collaboration in research and development uh, to innovate. And that uh, 32% uh, have uh, some claim to uh, patents that are based on formal, 32% of the patents, and the, the patents are still early to come in this region, are based on formal research and development collaboration. So you see here the key elements of modern <coughs> capitalism, the idea that innovation is a necessity, uh, that is the driver of economic growth and profit, uh, has become established in this region. Uh, Alibaba is one of the firms of this region. It started up very much like the other firms we studied uh, in, by a self-made entrepreneur who was formerly a high school teacher. So we see that in the rise of innovation that a modest amount of innovation is done by firms on their own. And more is done by firms through informal cooperation with other firms, because it's very expensive to have a research and development department that is standalone, and uh, they need to cooperate. And more are in innovations involved with formal cooperation, where a contract is signed between an institute or a firm or two entrepreneurs, uh, one signing contract for research, for research and development. But the most largest source of innovation, uh, which involves new products, new uh, ways to producing things, uh, new inputs, uh, new uh, ways of organizing production, come from a combination of formal and informal cooperation. <coughs> now, it's very tricky to cooperate in a country where the intellectual property rights are so weak. Uh, because supposing someone cheats on you, they take your idea and run with it. So it requires a high level of pro-social behavior. And remember, this is a region that had spades of it, going back to uh, 7000 BC. Uh, they were already an area of high levels of cooperation uh, that uh, were pro-social. So we see the emergence of this key quality of capitalism. So to <coughs> summarize, capitalism emerges through a bottom-up process of institutional innovations and organizational innovation, which secures the gain from cooperation, um, that cooperation wins, and it's important. <coughs> that there have been successive tipping points in the development of capitalism. Uh, that has something of a social movement quality, uh, that it becomes self-reinforcing. That is to say, it has a momentum that is endogenous within itself, uh, and that this begins to bring the state back in, uh, because the uh, 
capitalists are making so much wealth and that can be taxed, uh, that provides local economic development, which is so key to politicians, and provides jobs, the main source of jobs. So what we see in the way of summing up is that yes, China had a state-guided reform. And yes, Deng Xiaoping should be given a lot of credit for that uh, aspect uh, to enable this bottom-up process of institutional innovation and not block it uh, in the way that Mao had done. Uh, uh, but but he, he let it happen uh, and he uh, allowed it to take place as long as he was alive. And once it had acquired so much momentum, the process became self-reinforcing. Um, of course, it is still a country governed by the Chinese Communist Party, and as one of the entrepreneurs said to us, this is the boon in Shanghai, if the party wants you to die, you have no way to live. It's that simple. Uh, that, 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 that still the state has the final say. However, here you see why the state will accommodate and continue to accommodate capitalism in the modern form. This is the, uh, by province, all the provinces aggregated of the amount of production in 1978 of state-owned firms. And it declines progressively to 2006 when we began the study. I think this is probably more recent than that. I, I couldn't get the dates on the screen. So the, there's been a more or less linear decline in the industrial production of state-owned firms uh, as they go bankrupt, as they become privatized, as they become listed firms on the stock market with mixed ownership. This line, this is the big crossover, is the line on per capita income tax revenue that is collected by provinces uh, that comes from the private sector. So the revenue to government from taxation is growing and is inversely correlated with the output of state-owned firms. Um, and so if you're a provincial party secretary or a provincial uh, governor, you know where the future is leading you. That it's, you lose money with these uh, high-level state-owned production and you gain revenue uh, with increasing numbers of private firms and higher ratio of private production because you can tax them. Uh, they're profitable. And, and so this is why I think you see a steady but clear process of uh, government endorsement of what they never had expected, which they did not want, which was not part of their grand strategy the rise of this modern form of capitalism in China. And this is a photograph, uh, I was in Beijing and took a photograph in this little shop, and there was a curious sector, section that you could buy Mao buttons uh, from the great proletarian cultural revolution and uh, little red books uh, that people bought it as a momentum of the past. And then the main attraction were all these little gigaws that people uh, like to buy that reflected the new production of the uh, private entrepreneurs, uh, small commodity production, all sorts of other types of production. And I thought, well, that really shows the contrast uh, between the period uh, before when China really wanted to build itself as a forward-looking state govern and run economy, and the new uh, modern capitalism in China that now has taken root, that they cannot do without. Uh, they, there was a crucial meeting in 2004 of the Politburo, uh, and they wanted to reverse the clock if they could. Uh, and they concluded that at the end of the meeting they could not, that it, the genie was out of the bottle, that capitalism was a self-reinforcing growth machine, uh, providing too many jobs, too much wealth, and too much in the way of taxable income for government uh, not to want to support. So that's the story of the rise of a form of economy 
modern capitalist production, uh, where creative destruction is part of the rule, uh, and growth and innovation and creativity drives the economy, which was not there before. Uh, China's had a very developed market commercial economy, uh, merchants and shopkeepers, uh, but it didn't have this dynamic uh, form of capitalism uh, based on creative destruction. That is to say, not innovation shakes up the established industries and progress is made through this burst of entrepreneurial energy. Uh, so thank you.